Welcome to Ask the Expert, where we bring you the top experts on dog health, training, grooming, and more. You ask it, and we'll answer it. I'm Marissa Sarbag. Thank you for joining us today. April is Canine Fitness Month, so we have an entire month dedicated to promoting an active and healthy lifestyle for your dog. For All Matters Health, we turn to AKC Chief Veterinary Officer, Dr. Jerry Klein. He's here in our studio to make sure your dog is ready for all the fun sports and activities that come with springtime. So if this is your first time watching the show, sending us your questions is very simple. Just go to facebook.com slash American Kennel Club and comment your question on this video. So Dr. Klein, great to have you with us again. My pleasure. Why are we talking about canine fitness? I mean, everybody knows human fitness is so important, but people don't really think about how important it is to exercise your dog too. Well, just like in humans, obesity can be a factor in, in dogs and it can be a cause of a lot of medical problems like diabetes and other issues as well. And it can exacerbate uh, cardiopulmonary issues as well. So a dog that's in better shape has less of a chance of having some severe medical problems. And before you start exercising, when should you be seeing a vet? Just like in any activity, whether it's you or your animal, you should have a checkup by your veterinarian to make sure your dog is physically fit to embark on whatever particular activity you want to choose. And there are th certain things that are kind of maybe obvious, like the knees are weak or the hips are arthritic, but there are some hidden concerns as well. If a dog has a heart murmur or maybe low in thyroid, which could affect his metabolism and his activity level as well. Is this when we're talking about go see a vet before you start walking with your dog or really something more strenuous than that? Definitely something more strenuous. I think every vet, every animal should have at least a yearly vet exam. If you're thinking about doing something more strenuous, then I think it, that deserves a vet visit as well. All right, if we're just starting now, what are we talking about with the basics of canine fitness? What's the bare minimum? Well, conditioning is first and foremost, just like with people. You wouldn't embark on any kind of program if you're out of shape. And I think we, our aim should be some kind of activity five times a week, let's say. But we wanna start slow and be gradual. And we can start with something as simple as walking on a regular basis, short distances more often, uh, to hiking or jogging. Uh, agility. And there's so many AKC competitive events that are out there right now. Uh, there's herding and trailing and uh, sporting events that uh, and the fastest growing things in the AKC world. So there's a lot of involvement with people and animals and it creates a great bond between you and your dog. And what do you say to people who say the weather's bad, I don't really want to exercise myself today, I certainly don't want to take my dog outside. Well there's a lot of reasons why I don't want to go to the gym <laughs> if it's cold out or something, but bad weather should not be excused for no activity at all. You have to modify that, whether it's finding an area indoor like your basement that has rooms for like fetching or finding indoor facilities or even rearrange your furniture a little bit just so you can just kind of play with your dog in some way, shape or form. Uh, it doesn't have to be all out activity, but a little activity is better than no activity at all. Absolutely. And if you are not in shape and your dog is not in shape and you finally decided to make the switch, how can you get started to get in conditioning shape? Well, after your vet check, start slow and uh, start with walks and do whatever training is recommended. Uh, learn about it, go online, talk to people and trainers. Uh, the first thing you should realize is uh, what kind of dog you have, what are they capable of doing, and on what surfaces are you going to do these surfaces on. Uh, some surfaces are pretty hard on a dog, like asphalt and cement, they're really hard on their foot pads. Certain areas like grass and hard packed sand are a little easier on their joints. Now, what about when you're living in a city environment? Because I know we're in New York City right now and we have people all over who maybe don't have access to Central Park and, and really the cement and the asphalt is all they have. What can they do? Well, I think walking has always been known to be the best activity that has the least amount of harm to our joints. So uh, everybody has to walk, especially if you live in the city, you have to walk your dog. Uh, changing the routes, making it interesting for your dog and yourself, and changing the distance, mi mixing it up a little bit. Uh, start slow, getting the dogs used to it by the weather and the breed and the age, and then going from there. And talking about age, I mean, is there a point that your dog is too young? When should you start? Well, that's a great question, and the answer is yes. There's a right way and a wrong way. Uh, too young can be a problem, and too old can be a problem as well. Uh, a lot of it will depend on the type of dog you're dealing with large and we don't want to start any vigorous activity especially prolonged sustained activity like jogging or road working until a dog is fully mature and that means that their growth plates have fully fused now in large and giant breeds that could be anywhere between 12 to 18 months of age now smaller breeds are uh, made like a papillon or uh, let's say a pug may uh, 
fuse earlier. So we could do walking, you know, larger walking a little earlier than that. That being said, uh, they can still do th other things like flexibility work, agil uh, things like balance work, uh, and, and that can be done at a younger age as well. General rule of thumb is dogs up to six months of age shouldn't jump higher than their wrists. Six to 12 months of age shouldn't jump any higher than their elbows at medium sized dogs. And then when, to go higher, they should be fully mature at that time. And we do have a great question relating to this specific question. Rita says, what sports are good for my Bernie's mountain dog? He is nine months old. Well, they were bred to be, I think it's called carting dogs, which is where they pull carts. Mm -hmm. They were bred to do that in the Swiss mountains, and there are sports developed for that. In fact, the Bernese Mountain Club of America has uh, a show where they have dogs doing carting, and you can look that up and see activities and learn about it, but they like pulling things, mm -hmm. and uh, that's fantastic. But any activity will be great for a dog, but they are geared and they were bred to do that. So look for activities that may mimic that type of behavior. And does Rita have to have any concerns because her dog is nine months? At nine months, you want to start slow uh, because she's a large breed. Uh, maybe start with very, very light weights, if at all, or just teach her to drag something. And as she gets to be more like 12 to 14 months of age, uh, you can start using heavier weights. And start talking to people that do this. There's going to be active people. Go to the breed page, Bernese Mountain Club of America. Learn about this activity. Learn about people that are involved and then ask or call or write. And people that are involved in the sport are more than willing to share that information and you learn from that. I think that's such a great point. It's just, if you have questions, ask it, you know? Yeah, Somebody mean, will be able to answer it for you. People are so enthused about getting people involved in certain aspects of the sport mm -hmm. and they want new people coming into it. So if you have any questions, if you're interested, go for it. All right, now we talked about too young, but what about too old? Is there a point that a dog, you should say enough is enough, you can't exercise anymore? Well, speaking as a 65-year-old <laughs> man, old age is not a disease, <laughs> but with old age comes certain problems. And there's degenerative problems like osteoarthritis, uh, heart issues can get worse. So we have to tailor our exercise to the dog, the breed, and the age. Uh, and so, and realize that what they could do when they were younger, they may still mentally want to do it, but may not be physically be able to do it. And also, as dogs get older, uh, there'll be decrease in their sight and in their hearing, which may make their competitive aspect in certain sports a little less competitive because they, just, unfortunately, they're just not up to the par of a two or three year old dog. And I think this is so important, especially for me to focus on because we have an 11 year old dog in my family mm -hmm. and she constantly wants to walk. I mean, she will take me two and a half miles and just want to keep going in every direction she on our road. She must be a terrier. She is a terrier okay. breed, I know, yeah. And they're they're she, like ever ready batteries super that high will energy. go and go. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that's great. Uh, you know, as long as she's able to do it and you know that she has no other underlying problems, and then she's used to going to that uh, distance. There's no reason you can't do it. Plus it's good for you mm -hmm. too. And like I said, it forms a great bond. Uh, but you can also try to mix it up. You could try to find facilities that may have other things as well, like hiking, changing the terrain a little bit, or finding activities where she could do maybe some form of light agility work where she's going through hoops and keep her mind active. And that may be a new way for her to kind of channel her energy level. And, and she's a terrier, so we know she loves that. But what about other breeds? Are there, are there limits for certain breeds? I think that we always have to remember breeds were, were bred to do a certain function. So there are certain breeds that are very active naturally. Herding breeds, for example, uh, Shetland Sheepdogs, Australian Shepherds, they love to just be active all the time. And other breeds love to run and be active like Whippets and Siberian Huskies. But certain breeds were bred just to be companions a Pekingese or Italian Greyhound. So it's not that those members can't be active in their own way, but to ask to them to be uh, active in a vigorous activity would be unfair to them and to the breed and why it was developed in the first place. So if you are interested in that form of a sport, a very vigorous sport, maybe those breeds may not be the right breed choice for you and your family, which is why at AKC we always urge people to do your research and do the right, find the right match so that the type of dog you get will fit the lifestyle that you're gonna be leading. 
Right, because if you have a super active lifestyle, you re really need a dog that likes that too. Unless you're willing to carry that Pekingese <laughs> up the hill. And uh, that's up another way. That'll hunting. be your aerobic yeah, workout. Yeah, you won't yeah. need any more after that. No, no. <laughs> Our next question is in. John says, my golden loves swimming, but I don't like having a wet dog. What other sports can I do um, that are like swimming? Well, a retriever lives for the water, hence the name. So maybe, I mean, don't, get, maybe don't get another well, golden. Well, I mean, it's not to say that they can't do other things. They're great at obedience. They're re great at rally. In fact, many times they're in the top 10 dogs of dogs nationwide at the at year end rankings on obedience and other activities like that. So they are willing to please, they're willing to be active, and that's great. One thing about swimming I do want to mention swimming is great but can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Swimming, they have to have an easy way out. So in a pond or a lake where there's a shore and they can walk out, that's great. But be careful of things like pools that don't have steps because dogs have been known to drown in pools. So never leave them unattended, just like children. Uh, they can jump in, but they can't jump out of a pool. So we have to be very careful about uh, putting dogs in water, and making sure that their access to out of the water is as easy as jumping into the water. Should we be teaching them to avoid the pool at all, or should we be showing them this is where no, the I exit think, is? I think the secret is to never leave them unattended. Uh, they do make uh, little uh, uh, life inflator things for dogs like that, but they can get exhausted, and dogs have been known to drown in swimming pools, so we have to be careful of that. And what about for John's Golden? What else do you think he could do? Well, I think obedience is great. Agility was fantastic. In other words, keeping his mind active. He loves water. I mean, it's not, you may not be able to go all the time, but if he loves it and if he can allow the dog to do it every once in a while, I think that would be a great service to his dog. Yeah, life's about dog, compromise, right? You know what? <laughs> and it's, it's also about living. You know, you want, you want to enjoy certain aspects of it. Maybe not have cake every night, <laughs> but if you can have it, moderate it maybe like once a week or once a month, he'll enjoy it and he won't miss it. As long as you keep him, in, you know, uh, active in other ways as well, because you don't want to have a bored dog. Yeah, that's a great point. Jay has our next question. He says, I have a really calm dog. What are sports that can help him be more energetic? He does not like to play fetch. Well, activity can be both physical and mental. I think it's important to always realize that the brain is an organ as well that needs to be exercised. So puzzled type toys, uh, uh, putting food inside certain food, keeping them occupied in certain ways. I think every dog likes to be walked and whether it's for long distance or not, I think that they, what they enjoy is the activity of being with their person. So you have to find some niche that may make that dog more active. If that dog just wants to lie down, it's, it's nice, but it doesn't mean that you have to allow it to just do nothing. This is when your job, when you can be proactive and put the leash on your dog and just take him for walks and try to find some kind of activity or, or a park, dog park or something, as long as it's safe, uh, that you feel active and will get your dog stimulated. So no matter what breed you have and no matter what age, really walking is something everyone can and should do? I think walking is the fundamental go-to activity and exercise that has so much benefits and so few risks that it could be prescribed for man and beast on almost any basis. And I know we even talked about it in our yesterday show. It's great for people too. So not only is your dog getting the exercise, so are you. It's a win-win it situation. Really it has to be, yeah. I mean, in so many ways. Now, what if you have some type of injury that you're trying to get over or your canine has an injury? Is there any way that you can rehabilitate that? Well, it's like any injury, even in people, uh, there's been a lot of advances in those types of injuries. Sometimes you require surgery, a torn ACL or something else, a fractured toe may or may not need surgery, but surgery can be an option. But afterwards now we have more ability to do other things what we call integrative uh, pet care. So there might be physical therapy, hydrotherapy, water treadmills. Uh, there could be laser treatments. There could be massage, acupuncture, so many different things that could be done. So, and there are board certified physical therapists, veterinary physical therapists that you can consult with. When you're returning to back to your fitness schedule or maybe you wanna push it even more, how important is it to take it slow? Imperative, just like when, after we have an injury, they tell you to take it light and easy and go by the instructions of your veterinarian or your physical therapist as to how and when to start the activity.
If anybody wants to learn more about working in that physical activity environment, um, how would they get involved and learn more about that? What's so interesting is this has become a field. So now if people have an interest, and, and if you can either be a veterinarian and be certified in physical therapy, or if you're not a veterinarian, there are courses through university certification courses where they can be certified canine fitness trainers. So there's a field on that as well. So you should look that up online as well. Always great to learn more about everything in the dog world, kind of familiarize yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's if you have a passion for something, there might be a way for it, and it can be really an interesting way of life. All right, our next question is in. Vet says, why do vets recommend to neuter animals at such a young age? I have read data that it's not too good to fix them before they are three years old. Well, I think that's a controversial question, and I think not all vets recommend neutering and spaying at an early age anymore. I think that became a topic several decades ago uh, in response to the animal rights activists and spay and neutering overpopulation. And I understood the reason for it. If you just spay and neuter them earlier, there'd be less of, a, of an inclination to have uh, overpopulation. But with time, information comes and studies come. And we have found that uh, neutering or castrating too early could cause medical problems in the future, most notably orthopedic problems like ACL injuries and other issues as well. So the theory right now is a little different than it was maybe 10 years ago because we have information now that may dispute that fact, uh, which is, may not be a fact at all. So talk to your veterinarian about what they recommend for their breed, uh, for the breed that you have, about the proper age for spaying and neutering. It may not be any more recommended to be like at two or three months of age, which I don't recommend, mm -hmm. but maybe after they've gained their secondary sex characteristics. It depends what you're able to go with. If you can tolerate a female being in heat one time and the mess that it involves, but if you can allow that to happen or allow a dog to mature sexually, that may be the better time to, to do a spay or neuter at that time. So with the information that was uh, thought of maybe 15, 20 years ago is not necessarily the same information that we have now. Things are always changing in the medical Things field. are changing. I think it's important to keep in touch with that and to realize that what was fact then or, or certainly a theory then is factually different now with scientific data. Now going off Beth's topic there a little bit, neutering and spaying, I mean, is that changing an energy level in your dog? It does. It's hormones. Mm -hmm. And just like we know with people, hormones do matter. And so uh, with the lack of certain hormones, they become more sedentary, uh, more uh, the body mass changes. So we have to, and, 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 then, and then with that, I think mental uh, awareness, and they become a little quieter as well, which is even more reason to be on some kind of physical, uh, physical activity and exercise regime to keep them going because we don't want to just let them be couch potatoes. So it really is up to the owner to keep pushing that dog. It's imperative that we, when they don't want to, that we tr uh, make them be the best dogs they can be, whether they're spayed, neutered, or intact. Our next question is in. Nicole says, what are your thoughts on canine weight vests? I've seen some dogs build great muscle tone with these, but I have a lot of concerns regarding the amount of stress they put on joints. I have three dogs, competitive in agility, lure coursing, and dock diving. Nicole is busy, I'm sure. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm not that familiar with weight vests, so I can't mm -hmm. comment directly on that because I've never used it. I think the premise that she's uh, mentioning is like us wearing a weight vest or certain things like that as well. If you do it the right way, it's probably good. If you do it the wrong way, things can happen. So uh, if you move the wrong way, you can hurt your back. If you do certain things, if you do uh, presses the wrong way, you can hurt your knees. So I'm not gonna comment on that because I don't wanna give her the wrong information and I haven't used it. It's a great question, but like everything else, there's probably a right way and a wrong way, the right dog and the wrong dog to use it for. Mm -hmm. Uh, Abhijit has our next question. Can you speak precautions about walks, long and short, in summer's high temperatures, especially with a seven-year-old golden retriever with long, thick fur? Hot weather has become extreme. Even in Chicago, we get like these heat warnings, and it's ne they're never surprises, thankfully. That's one good thing we have now, where they don't come out of the blue. So we have warnings, and I think the general rule of thumb is whether it's a golden retriever that has long hair or a breed like a bulldog or a pug that has short noses and can't exchange air properly. Uh, the time to do those long walks in hot weather is very early in the morning and very late at night. And otherwise, keep them in air conditioning or do your walks just short just to uh, go outside, make their business, and then bring them back in. We don't want to cause any risk in, uh, in the name of activity and exercise. But it might mean you have to get up a little bit earlier before it gets really hot 
and then walk them really late in the evening when the sun is, uh, is much less intense. You have to moderate our activity to the climate, to the dog, and do the right thing as much as possible. And I think that just goes back to what you were talking about earlier about not letting the weather interfere too much in your plants. You could always exercise indoors if you can find a spot for that. And you can. And, uh, you know, as I said, thankfully, even in areas like Arizona where people have to go outside with their dogs, they do it at the right time. You know, and very early in the day is the right time before the sun is up because it can get hot very fast there. And otherwise, you try to keep them in. You let them out just long enough to do what they need to do, and you do, you tailor your exercise to the times when it's more amenable and more uh, safe. Probably, if it's too hot for you, it's too hot for your dog. That's always the rule. If it's too hot or too cold for you, it's probably too hot or too cold for your dog. Mm -hmm. Catherine has our next question. Uh, my dog, a 16-month-old Palm She, what causes coughing a lot after drinking? Uh, I think she's, after drinking a lot, the dog is coughing. Well, I can't say for sure, don't know how old. Coughing can be caused from so many different 16 things. Months. 16, 16 months. 16 months, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, one thing, she, uh, uh, Palm She's could be a combination of Pomeranians and Shih Tzus, and they can have their issues. Pomeranians and certain toy breeds have something called tracheal collapses. Uh, the trachea is the windpipe and it's made of little cartilaginous rings. Sometimes if dogs push on a leash or get excited, uh, they can have spasms of the trachea. If it's like a dry honking cough, that could be something like that. If it's in related to water drinking, it could be related to her soft palate because part of the Shih Tzu problem. So she should have her dog checked out by her veterinarian and have, try to see if they can figure out the answer on that. I think that's always the safest bet. If you have any questions, well, go Well, because there's your different vet. reasons. You don't yeah. want to make a blank statement. Mm -hmm. And especially when you have a dog that has two breeds, each having their own set of issues, you don't know which it inherited from each one, or neither, or something completely unique. So I hate to mention something like that without knowing exactly what it is. Those are both possibilities, but let the veterinarian come up with the actual diagnosis. Great to know. All right, that's it for us for questions. Dr. Klein, anything else you want to say about Canine Fitness Month before we let you go today? Well, I think like, you know, an orthopedic guy once told me, uh, life is motion and motion is life. Mm -hmm. You stop moving, you stop living. So our, our goal is to keep ourselves active, keep ourselves living a good life. Great way to end the show. Thanks yeah. so much, Dr. Klein. Appreciate it. My pleasure. <laughs> well, that is all for today. I'm Marissa Sarbeck. Thank you for joining us. Next week on Ask the Expert, we'll have AKC TV dog trainer and Family Dog Magazine contributor Kathy Santo on the show. She'll have 10 ways to improve your dog walks now that you've learned you need to be doing them. And at the same time, Wednesday at noon, so get those questions ready. Then catch us Friday for an all-new AKC Dog Center, and that is also at noon Eastern Standard Time. We are bringing you the latest dog news from the American Kennel Club. Be sure to download AKC TV on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire. You can also download us on our app, Google Play, and on iOS. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram as well. We love to chat on social media. AKC TV, sit, stay, watch.